Amen. 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 That's our prayer, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. God's, God's building his kingdom here and abroad, and we get to be a part of that. Um, and so I thought with our in-gathering service just a week away, it would be good for us today to look at a passage of Scripture that is all about why we do what we do when it comes to missions. Why do we do that? Why do we engage in missions? Why do we have the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? Biblically, why? And so I'm going to invite you to turn to the 10th chapter of Romans this morning, which is one of the great texts that really uh, answers that question. And what we see in Romans 10 uh, is that we are rescued to be a rescuer. God has rescued us, and, and now he's, he's called us to, to join in that rescue of people here in our community and around the world. Romans chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse uh, 5 and read through verse 15. If you'll follow along in your copy of God's Word. Since Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you. In your mouth and in your heart This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord is Lord of all who and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Father, we, we thank you. Those of us who are, who are here uh, in Christ, we, we, we thank you for the person or persons that first told us about Jesus, whether it was a parent or a friend or somebody at, at church, we thank you for their, their faithfulness to share the gospel w- with us. And we know that there are people around the world that have little or no access to that. And we thank you that we get to be a part of praying of, of giving, sometimes of going and, and sending, sending a, a team of people to, that are going around the world in obedience to the great commission that you have given all of us, all of us, to go and make disciples of all nations, of all peoples throughout the world. Lord, we thank you for your grace in, in, in rescuing us. And, and now we know that you have put a call on all of our lives to, to join you in that rescue mission of, of others. Lord, I pray for anyone who's here today or maybe watching 
the stream of this service to today or at any point in the future that needs to be rescued, that hasn't yet come to know Christ as their Savior and Lord, would you make this a day of salvation and rescue in their lives? Would, would you open the eyes of people's hearts to see Christ and his love for them today? And for those of us who know Christ, would you open our eyes even wider to the, to the mission that you've called us to? And it's in his name that we pray, amen. On June 27th, 1976, Air France Flight 139 took off from Tel Aviv en route to Paris. There were 246 people on board the plane, the vast majority of whom were Jewish and Israeli. The plane made a scheduled stop in Athens where they picked up 58 more passengers, unfortunately four of whom were hijackers. Shortly after the plane took off from Athens, the terrorist took over the, the plane and diverted it to, of all places, Entebbe, Uganda, in Africa. But maybe not so surprising, because the, the leader of Uganda at that point was a man named Idi Amin, who not only knew about the hijacking in advance, but supported the terrorists. After the plane landed in, in Entebbe, ominously, all of the Jewish passengers were separated out from the rest of the passengers, and the terrorists began to make demands to kill one Jew after another until the Israeli government emptied their jails of terrorists. Well, Israel stalled for time, but all the while the, the Mossad was busy at work, planning one of the most daring rescue operations of all time. It took place on July 4th, 1976, our nation's bicentennial, on, on the same day that Americans were, were celebrating the 200th anniversary of our freedom, there was a, a group of 100 Israeli commandos that were flying 2,500 miles from Israel to Uganda in an attempt to rescue and bring freedom to, to their people, to those hostages. It was, it was absolutely uh, amazing what happened. Out of, out of all of the hostages, all but, all but three of them were saved. All the terrorists were killed. There was one Israeli soldier that was killed, Jonathan Netanyahu, the brother of Benjamin Netanyahu, who, who was later to become prime minister of Israel. That, that rescue operation, Operation Thunderbolt, it's, it's still studied by analysts and, 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 and written about and remembered as just one of the most daring, greatest rescue missions in, in history. But as followers of Christ, we have been on the receiving end of the greatest rescue mission of all because we were held hostage by sin and death itself, but, but Christ came and took, on the cross, took sin and death upon himself and rose from the dead so that we could be set free. 
And every single person in this room, every single person watching this video is either in one of two categories today. Either we need to be rescued, and if you don't yet know Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're in need of rescue, whether you've realized it until today or not. We either need to be rescued, or if we are in Christ, we have been called to a rescue mission of others. We've been rescued to be a rescuer. And this text tells us about both of those things. It's, it tells us how to be rescued, and it tells us about joining the rescue mission. First of all, being rescued. Being rescued. Let's, let's look at what the Bible says here in verse 5. Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law. The one who does these things will live by them. Well, what's the problem there? <laughs> the problem is that all of us have failed to do that. We have failed miserably to obey the law of God. And that's bad news. Because Galatians 3.10 says this. The Bible says in Galatians 3.10 that for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Anybody here done everything written in the book of God's law? We haven't come close to doing that. Like we have failed miserably to do that. And the Bible says everyone who does not do everything written in the book of law of the law is cursed. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. Galatians 3.13 says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. On the cross, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by taking that curse on himself, by taking our sin debt, which we could never pay because of our failure to obey God's law. Christ took our failure to obey the law, took our sins, took the curse, took that debt that we could never pay, took it on himself, and paid it in full in our place. He took the curse on himself so that the curse could be lifted from us. And that means that rescue is available. And we see that in verses six through eight. The Bible says there, but the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you. In your mouth and in your heart, this is the message of faith that we proclaim. Rescue, the Bible says, is close. It's within our reach. Why? Because God has reached out to us. And so therefore, we don't have to ascend up to try to bring Christ down. He's already come down. That's what Christmas is all about, the incarnation. God became man. Now, we don't have to reach down into the abyss to try to bring Christ up from the dead. No, he's already risen from the dead. New Testament scholar Colin Cruz says this, no one is being asked to bring about an incarnation or a resurrection. One is asked only to accept in faith what has already been done. And so, therefore, salvation is, is close by. It's near. Have you ever lost something, thought you lost something <laughs> that was actually really near, nearby? That's happened to me multiple times. Um, it's happened with my phone lots of times. Uh, most recently, it happened with some 
cash. So I'll embarrass myself once again here with my uh, absent-mindedness. But when Melissa and I went to see Esther the other day in, in Pennsylvania, staying at a hotel in Lancaster, and so as is my custom, I got up like super early in the morning, and I was in search of coffee, which was not available at the hotel. And so Waffle House is open 24 hours. And so, you know, I'm headed to Waffle House to get breakfast and, and coffee. So I, I brought more cash than what I would typically bring on a trip because I'd heard, you know, Lancaster, you know, Amish markets and all that, and maybe it would be cash only. So, you know, I, I brought some, some cash. And so I, you know, this is like pitch dark. It's still like practically the wee hours at this point. And I'm, I just didn't want to be walking around in a dark place I didn't know with a bunch of cash. So I, I took most of the cash out of my wallet and, and, and left it in the room thought nothing else about it until we checked out of the hotel and stopped at a market on our way out of town. And I'm like, honey, I, I took a lot of my cash out that we brought for the market. And I, I took it out and I, I, I think I left it in the room. And so fortunately, we're still in Lancaster at this point. And so we go back to the hotel. I go up to the desk. I'm like, we just checked out a few minutes ago. Has anybody gone into our room <laughs> since, since that happened? They're like, well, I, we're, I don't know. Um, and, and so they let me go back up and search. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking around and I just, I don't see it anywhere. And so Melissa's out in the car and because she knows her husband all too well, she's looking through different bags um, for the cash. And just as I'm about to really, you know, go high octane freak out mode, I look at my phone and it's flashing Melissa Hayes and I answer it with hopes that there's good news on the other end. And there was. Because she says, um, I have the cash. Um, it's in the side pocket of your toiletry bag where you zipped it up the other morning. And... I remembered, yeah, I, that's, that's what I did. I zipped it up on the side packet of my toiletry bag. So what I thought was lost, it was actually really nearby. But you know what? Unlike my cash in that instance, um, you could really be lost. You could be here in this room or you could be watching this live stream or this video at some point in the future, and you could really be lost. But I want to tell you some good news. Rescue is actually nearby. It's near. In fact, rescue, the Bible says, is as close as your mouth and your heart. What, is it, what does it say in verses 9 and 10? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Could this be any clearer? There's, there's an internal part of this and there's an external part of this. First of all, there's an internal part. Believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. But, but listen, believing in Jesus is different than just believing stuff about Jesus. Even if it's the right stuff about Jesus. Believing in Jesus is, is different. It's not just like a mental assent to facts. I could tell you that the oceanfront is 35 miles from where we are. And that's true according to Google Maps. And you could believe that and you're believing the truth. It's not gonna change your life. But suppose you were at the oceanfront and you were in the ocean drowning and I were to offer you my hand, and I were to say, take it. 
take it, I'll save you. Well, to believe me in that instance is gonna result in your rescue. To believe in Jesus means that you take his nail-scarred hand and you, you give your life into his hands. It's not just sort of believing about him, it's believing in him. It's giving your life over into his, his hands. Believe in your heart. And then confess with your mouth. Because you know what, if you've truly believed in your heart, you're going to confess with your mouth. It's not something that you're gonna stay silent about. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, therefore everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. In other words, if we've truly believed in our heart, if it's real, then we're going to confess Christ with our mouth. And listen, we really need to understand what, what this means. Paul, Paul is writing in Romans to a, a group of Romans, a group of people living in Rome, in the heart of the Roman Empire, in the first century, where believers were persecuted. And for them to confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, there was a price to pay in that. New Testament scholar Michael Byrd says this, what is provocative is that Paul writes these words to a cluster of house churches in the heart of the Roman Empire, living right under the emperor's nose and boldly declaring the lordship of a Jewish man executed by the Romans as a common criminal. It's provocative because the Roman emperor was the one hailed as Kyrios, Lord, across the empire. At the time Paul was writing, one can find inscriptions and papyri, all attesting that Nero is Lord. Well, guess what? If Jesus is Lord, then Nero is not. And that's, what these, that's the confession that these early believers were making. But let's carry that over into our lives. For us to confess Jesus is, is Lord means that lots of other things are not Lord. If Jesus is Lord, then money is not. If Jesus is Lord, then our sexual freedom is not. If Jesus is Lord, then comfort is not. If Jesus is Lord, then even family is not. If Jesus is Lord, then job is not. If Jesus is Lord, then popularity is not. You see, to confess Jesus is Lord is to forsake all other lords. Look at verses 11 through 13. But the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you see here the universality of this invitation? Like this invitation is for everyone, right? Look at all three of these verses. Verse 11, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 12, there's, there's no distinction. The same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. And then in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This invitation goes out to all. And that means you. You're included in that. Being rescued. Second, joining the rescue mission. Let's look at verses 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him they've not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? 
And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So let's remember Paul's context here in, in his situation in the first century. What, what's the Apostle Paul been doing with his life? He's going from place to place, from city to city. He's, and he's going pla- places uh, just like a lot of our missionaries today are going to places where nobody knows anything about Christ. What, what does he say that his ambition is? Turn in your Bibles to chapter 15 and verse 20. Turn over a couple of pages to, to chapter 15 and verse 20. What's, what's the Apostle Paul's aim here? He says, my aim is to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. Where people have never heard of him. And listen, it's hard for us as Americans to conceive this. But like, there are so many places in this world, so many peoples in this world that have never heard, never heard. Christ has not been named. And and that's really the the priority with the International Mission Board. It's really what the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is all about. It's, It's sending people to go into, to places and to peoples where Christ has not been named. Now, why do we do that? Because Paul's Lord and our Lord has commanded us to do that. Jesus commands us in the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, all peoples, We do it because Jesus has commanded us to. And now what Paul does is he sort of very logically unpacks why he's doing this and why we are called to do this. He says in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But, but then he begins to ask a series of rhetorical questions. And the first one in verse 14 is this. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? Now this flows directly out of verse 13. Which says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they do that? How can they call upon the name of the Lord and be saved How can they call on him they have not believed in? And the answer is obvious. They can't. And then he asks the second rhetorical question here in verse 14. And how can they believe without hearing about him? And again, the answer is obvious. They can't. And then he asks the third question. And how can they hear without a preacher? And he's not just talking about he talks about preacher. He's not just talking about like somebody that like does what I do. He's talking about how, how can they hear without somebody proclaiming the message? And the answer, again, is obvious. They can't. And then he asks another question in verse 15. And how can they preach unless they are sent? Because even at this stage of the game, when Paul is writing in the first century. Someone had to send them. Someone was sending the Apostle Paul and the other missionaries. We see this pattern very clearly in the book of Acts. For instance, in Acts 13, in verses 2 and 3, this is a picture of of a church like ours. It's a local church. It was a church at Antioch. So what, 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 what were they doing as they sent people out? We see it so clearly in Acts 13, 2 and 3. 
As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them out. Now that is what the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is all about. It is our church sending. You know, sometimes the lostness of this world can just seem overwhelming. I mean, when you think about the billions of people in the world and the conditions that many people are, are living in and, you know, totalitarian governments and false religions and, I mean, just on and on and on. And the bigness, the bigness of the world. I mean, like, sometimes it can just seem overwhelming. And the great commission that Jesus has given us to go to all of those peoples with the good news of the gospel can seem overwhelming. But you know what? We have the blessing of, of not having to sit around and, and wring our hands and just kind of wonder, how in the world can we obey the Great Commission? Because we can't obey it. In, in the International Mission Board, we have a force of people, 3,500 and growing, that is seeking to do that very thing. And if we're not in a country or in a people group yet, we pretty much know who they are. We know the groups that still need to be reached and we're sending people to reach them. But they cannot be sent without sending churches like ours. That, that's why the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is just like the most strategic thing that you could possibly do with your resources. You are making an eternal difference in the lives of people around the world that you will never see until we're all in glory together. And then we'll know the impact that has been made. But listen, what could be more strategic what gift could you possibly give this Christmas that could be more important than that? And so this week, as you pray, I want to encourage you. Use the prayer guide that you received today and be praying toward next Sunday, toward our end gathering. Whether you're able to give a widow's might, or whether you are able to give a, a large gift. And if you're blessed to be able to give largely to this, then I want to encourage you and challenge you to do that, to do that very thing. Our church goal is $60,000. And in order to be able to meet that, we need you. If you are able to give largely and sacrificially and maybe extraordinarily to this, there's literally nothing more strategic that you could possibly do because this gift is making an immediate difference in the lives of people around the world as our missionaries are deployed to do all kinds of works of mercy and love and compassion. And so it's making an immediate difference in the lives of people around the world. But it's doing more than that. It's making an eternal difference. Because as our workers around the world are loving on people and engaged in ministries of mercy with people around the world, they're sharing the good news of the gospel. They're sharing about the only Savior that there is. They're sharing the best news in the world. And that's how Paul concludes here in verse 15. He uses this incredible image, which we saw in Isaiah 52 when we were walking through Isaiah. You remember it? Look at verse 15. 
He says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So the image here is of a herald, a runner, running into a city and announcing victory. Victory on the battlefield to a city who had been waiting in eager anticipation and hoping for good news, hoping that an invading army was not gonna come into their city, but when they would look out of their city and they could see the feet of the runner approaching the city, the feet of that runner were such a beautiful sight to them because they knew that good news was coming. They knew that that runner was, was running into the city to bring good news of victory. And see, we have the incredible opportunity to deploy heralds <laughs> that are gonna go into cities, runners going into cities throughout the world so that as we sung earlier, that praises would rise, joyous praises would rise to Christ, the one who is worthy of praise, that joyful praises to Christ will rise from every city in the world, every hamlet, every village, every tribe and tongue. What an amazing thing to be a part of that. And we are called to it as followers of Christ, as those who have been rescued. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the mission that you have given us. We thank you for your rescue in our lives. Father, we pray for anyone, anyone here, anyone listening who needs to be rescued. I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would open eyes to see the love of Christ and to turn to him and trust in him today. And Father, for those of us who are in Christ, who've experienced your rescue, you've called us to be on mission, to be rescuers. And so Lord, help us to do that faithfully as we, as we pray for you to raise up laborers to go to the ends of the earth. As we give faithfully that they may be sent And Lord, you may be dealing with the hearts of someone now to go themselves. Lord, may, may we say, Jesus is Lord. Whatever that means today in our lives. For some, it will mean coming to know Christ as Savior and Lord. For others, it, it, it will mean laying aside things that we have tried to put in your place. Because confessing you as Lord means to forsake our idols, to forsake all other lords. May you reign on the throne of our lives today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.